Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you a little bit today. Um, I'm going to talk to you, my title says, Short and Intermediate Term Earthquake Hazard in Canada. Um, we actually like to call that time-dependent earthquake hazard. And actually, um, the two talks that came before me have actually really helped with what I'm going to try and talk to you about. Um, John quite rightly pointed out that um, earthquake forecasting um, is not today something that is um, generally useful to the community, at least not to the engineering community that does earthquake hazard. Um, I would tell you that that's changed. 15 years ago, John would have said, you can't do earthquake forecasting. And time-dependent hazard is really, in some ways, what we like to think of as earthquake forecasting. And I'm going to talk to you today, uh, give you an intro as to what that is, and how, at least what the practical, usable, potentially usable earthquake forecasting um, techniques might be, what those outputs might look like. And then I'm going to follow that with some examples of how we then might make them useful to this community. And that's been, I think, the biggest um, benefit um, uh, for my work and I hope for the uh, network that we've been doing is how we might use those. So earthquakes. Earthquakes occur in many, many places. Large earthquakes, we get them in Alaska, Chile, Iran, and Cascadia. And John has already shown you maps of that. Again, I can, skip, I can skip right through most of this. You now know where all the biggest earthquakes occur. And you know that in Canada, we also have small to moderate earthquakes in the east and potential for larger events. Why do we care? Well, the damage and destruction from earthquakes has historically been unpredictable. So um, while today we know what the damage might be as a result of work by people like Gale, his, we still have a very hard time knowing when that earthquake is going to occur. And when turns out to be the hardest part of what we do. So a lot of work, though, in the last 10 to 15 years has really focused on using a lot of the very new and larger data sets of small events to tell us something about both the precise location of those upcoming events and when they might occur. I'm going to show you a few earthquakes from around the world. You've heard about Canadian ones so far, so I haven't included those here. But there are a few, that I am, a few earthquakes in regions I'm going to talk about as examples, so I wanted to give you some pictures to help you remember them. There is, of course, the Haiti earthquake, a magnitude 7 earthquake that happened two years ago, yester two years ago yesterday. I might get my years right. It had approximately 200,000 dead and $14 billion in damages. This is the San Francisco earthquake. I'm going to talk a fair amount about California because California is really the first place that freely available, high quality, small seismic event data became available to those of us in the community who wanted to look at how earthquakes changed in time on smaller time scales. <laughs> Nobody felt any shaking, right? OK, so we're all OK? okay. <clears throat> This is, of course, the Tohoku or Sendai earthquake and tsunami a year ago. 20,000 dead, as much as 30 billion in damages, and again, a magnitude 9. And these are, of course, some of the very famous pictures from that event. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well. I was also going to talk a lot about hazard maps, but I think I get to not do that now, because John did that for me. This is, of course, an older hazard map from the 1985 map from Canada, and a worldwide hazard map. And again, these are estimates of hazard associated with ground shaking in particular regions of the world. So probabilistic hazard. You know what hazard is, so what's forecasting? Hazard maps are generally used to characterize the likelihood in any given region that any given region is going to undergo some shaking due to a large earthquake. And it's a probability based. It's a, it's a, it's a, 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 a probability assessment of the ground shaking. A forecast provides the probability of an actual earthquake occurring at some specific location over a fixed period of time in the future. So now we're not looking at a 50-year hazard map, but we're going to take the data we have and try and come up with what our best estimate is of the probability of a single earthquake or a set of, of earthquakes of a particular magnitude range in that same region over a shorter period of time. And that's the general idea. Today. We are working on both intermediate term forecasting. Intermediate term tends to, be a, tends to be five to 10 years. Those are the kinds of numbers we're talking about. 
and also short-term early warning systems. And I'm going to talk about those as well here today. We've got some new work associated with that that I'm hoping you'll find interesting. The idea here is that these would post warnings at the very first signs of a significant earthquake or tsunami. Seismicity data has historically been recorded. This is one of the first se um, seismometers from China um, in 1831. This one depended on the ground, on um, the water in this pot moving back and forth and tipping, falling into these mouths and tipping over these stands. And you would get an estimate of both the direction and the size of the shaking. Of course, we have pendulum seismometers that were invented in the 1700s. I mention all these because these only recorded the largest events. And it wasn't until digital recording devices began, began recording our smallest events that earth, true earthquake forecasting really became possible. Earthquake forecasting, you, you heard John tell you also that one of the issues we have with large events back through time is they're very rare. That means that we don't have very many records, and our accuracy on how often they occur is quite large. As, as he said, there's a 550-year recurrence interval for the largest event in Cascadia, but we don't know exactly, we don't have a good estimate on the inter-event time <coughs> variance. So how many, what's the plus and minus that might go on that 550 years? So there is certainly a, a measurable probability of that same earthquake occurring now, 250 years before that 550 year recurrence time. So, but the small events, because we measure so very many of them, we, have a, we, can, we can narrow down that error estimate. So we can get an idea of both the location, a narrower location in space, and a narrower location in time, simply because we now, with digital seismometers, record so many of those small events. Again, 500,000 earthquakes per year worldwide and 10,000 in Southern California alone. So this is just one example of a potential forecast map. And there are many others out there now. In the last 10 years, we have seen the rise of um, easily a dozen different techniques for doing what we call seismicity-based earthquake forecasting. So again, using those small events to tell us the likely location over a given shorter interval of time of a, a large event of a particular magnitude in a region. And, and there is actually an organization out there today that compares all of these particular methods. I can direct you to that website if you're interested. They are running test sites in Italy in California, in Japan, and in a number of other different parts of the world in which they compare these seismicity-based forecasting techniques, techniques that produce maps like this, with each other to see what kind of information they produce, how good that information is for forecasting, and again, what their strengths and relative strengths and weaknesses might be. Again, that organization, it's called CSEP, has only been developed in the last 10 years as, it became, as, as the, it became more and more widely recognized. There was a lot of information in that small scale seismicity, low magnitude seismicity, magnitudes three and below. The information in that database tells us something about the underlying potential changes in the Earth. Again, this is one example. And this is, of course, a hazard map for California, similar to the hazard maps you saw before. This is a California hazard map. And this is a forecast hazard map. This particular one was a 10-year forecast, so an intermediate term forecast for earthquakes of magnitude greater than 5, again, a target magnitude in California from 2000 to 2010. And of the 39 earthquakes that happened in California, that's what these blue circles are, 37 of them fell within one of these high, within or within the margin of error of one of these highlighted areas. And um, I like to point that out because of those 37 that fell within, there were two that didn't. That's on one, seven and eight. And you'll notice that they're on the very fringes of our data coverage. And the reason for this is that this is a data dependent method. You have to have good data. And I'm going to show you some more examples as we go through of why the data is important and how it can affect the results we get. And, and that's, um, again, one of, the, one of the great things about this collaboration, the, the, uh, the strategic network, um, is that you heard Gail talk a little earlier and, and, and um, John about the better catalogs that are being produced for, for Canada. Those better catalogs provide us the opportunity to make assessments similar to this 
and without the kind of noise that we used to have as well. <coughs> so again, this one, I told you 37 out of 39 events occurred in California during 2000 and 2010 and were successfully forecast. And we had two misses. Again, that's a um, data problem. Again, we don't have good data in the oceans here. Again, one of the things you can do with these, though, is you now have potential locations for upcoming events. And the idea here is that you can make decisions based on those. For example, you could run rupture scenarios similar and produce shake maps similar to the ones Gail just showed you for areas of California and, and get an, an idea of what the actual damage might be in these locations as a result of this upcoming earthquake. And that's one of the, I'm going to show you an example of that in a few minutes. This is Haiti. This is the Haitian earthquake in 2010, and I told you I was going to use this as an example as well. This is where the earthquake actually occurred, of course, and this is the associated shake map. And we can see the significant magnet, uh, modified Mercalli intensity of 9 and 10, which occurred in and around um, Port-au-Prince. This is a forecast done as of the beginning of 2010. So again, there's, when you produce a forecast like this, there's no data from 2010 in this. This is from um, five years before. And you can see the actual location of the earthquake and its aftershocks where they occurred. So it does a, quite a good job of actually finding that location before the earthquake happened. This is a five-year forecast, so again, intermediate term time scales. However, there's a large false positive problem here. There's a lot of locations where, um, where Earthquakes don't happen or haven't happened yet. There's a lot of noise. We're going to call that noise or false positives. Locations where earthquakes haven't happened. And you have to think about what you want to do with those. One of the problems here is the data is, again, not very good in Haiti. They have, they have very few, had at that time anyway, very few seismometers on the island. And again, you can't eliminate the false positives here. You can't get rid of that noise without good data. So that's one of the things that's very important to this method, and that's an example here. The other thing I want to point out to you is that the, it is not uncommon in the Earth for small events to occur and large earthquakes to not follow. Sometimes we have small earthquakes that occur, swarms or foreshocks or, or a clustering of earthquakes, and we get a large earthquake like the magnitude 7. Sometimes we don't. And you're going to remember that from one of my examples in the next couple of slides. This is for Eastern Canada. This is some work we've done over the last mm, five or six years. This is a forecast for Eastern Canada from 2002 to 2012. And this is a 10-year um, forecast. And what we've done here is done some, some studies on how we would clean up this false positive problem. So you can see that here, there's a, this is, again, very much in some ways like the maps you've seen before. There's the, um, the high, high level of seismicity, which occurs along um, the very eastern coast. You have this clustered seismicity between Montreal and Ottawa. And then again, some small, smaller level seismicity, which occurs down through the rest of the Great Lakes. If you actually look at the quality of your data and spend some time with it, you, can act, you discover that it actually makes sense to use not all the very smallest events, but what we would call the next level up, magnitude fours. And you can significantly reduce this false positive rate. And on top of this, I plotted both earthquakes in green, which occurred just before 2002, and the earthquakes that have happened since. And again, you can see, of course, that there are anomalies near the Ottawa earthquake, which occurred in Val d'Oise and as well as the um, 2002 earthquake, which occurred in um, upstate New York. And it does really a, remark a re relatively good job in this particular case of the nine earthquakes that are on this map. Um, eight of them were successfully predicted. This one wasn't, of course. And again, I would tell you that we don't have as good data in these parts of Canada for seismometers, not as good seismometer coverage, um, for, because in general, we don't see as much hazard in those places, and it hasn't been a priority. This is the June 2010 Ottawa or Val d'Oise earthquake. It was a magnitude of approximately five. And again, if you, do an, if you do actually do a forecast as of 2007, you do an even better job of, again, removing the false positives and coming up with a very nice forecast for the location of that earthquake. One of the things that I would, so one of the projects that we have ongoing and is part of this network, and we're just about, now that we've got the catalogs cleaned up and the, and the method good at, at get, getting rid of the noise, one of our um, the next steps in our project is to take these maps and produce um, scenario shake maps 
like the ones that Gail showed you earlier for Gatineau, only instead of choosing Gatineau, we choose one of these particular locations. So now we have an act, we, now we have an actual location where we can we can put that earthquake in and produce an associated shake map that goes with it. And that's the last stage of the project that Gail and I are working on in this particular area. This is the uh, a forecast for Western Canada 2011 to 2017. And while we have not had an earthquake greater than magnitude 5 there um, anywhere down in the south coast, um, there was an earthquake last um, year up here, and you can see that the method comes relatively close. Again, within one box size, the one box size is about the error on these, one box size of the actual location of those events. This particular part of the world proposes a lot of challenges for doing this kind of work because the, a lot of the earthquakes that happen here are, are at depth. And again, our, you have to have constant background rates, you have to have constant numbers of small earthquakes occurring on a regular basis. You have to have a good long-term database in order to bang the noise down on this. And in order to do that, you have to be able to image the locations of those earthquakes quite well. And that's one of the, th one of the problems when you get out in the ocean, just as you saw in California. Um, we don't have a lot of seism seismometers on top of these locations. That becomes a problem in actually getting good locations and doing accurate forecasting. So we've been working on that in Western Canada, but I'm going to show you some work coming up on the Tohoku earthquake, on the Sendai earthquake, because um, as uh, that er particular earthquake, not only do the Japanese have a very good seismic network, but they have produced, um, it, since the earthquake itself, there have been a lot of excellent records produced. And that's, again, part of the collaboration that we have going at Western between Gail and myself. There are. Together, we are looking at those data sets to see how we can take what we learn there and, and move them back here to Western Canada to learn, about what we, to learn more about the Western Canadian um, Cascadian seismic zone as a result. And so I'm going to show you some of that in a few minutes as well. So again, I showed you the seismometer, and I talked to you about the data. Time-dependent earthquake forecasts, again, will provide us a probability of an earthquake occurring at a specific location over a fixed period of time in the future. And I give you here a quote from Tom Jordan and Lucy Jones in 2010. Data other than seismicity have been considered in earthquake forecasting. Things like radon and animal behavior and other things like that. So far, studies of non-seismic precursors have not quantified short-term probability gain. And they cannot be incorporated into operational forecasting methodologies. However, today our focus, the community's focus, will be on seismicity-based methods, similar to the ones I just showed you, that are enabled by high-performance seismic networks. Again, good data, small events. What can we learn about time-dependent earthquake hazard? So what is operational earthquake forecasting? The success of this particular method, the one I showed you and others, have, as I told you, led to something called the Collaboratory for the Study of Earthquake Predictability, CSEP. They evaluate short and intermediate term earthquake models, forecasting models, that demonstrate some significant probability gain. The idea here is to try and figure out what we can learn and how much more information we can gain from these small events. The goal is to provide the goal of operational earthquake forecasting, and this is now a very specific term that's used in the community, is to provide the public with considered useful information on that time dependence of regional seismic hazard. The idea here is that it is incumbent on a responsible government to provide information to its citizens if there is some kind of measurable gain in the probability of an earthquake in the near future. This is the result of the, we call them challenges, um, that came to scientific and public attention with the occurrence of the L'Aquila earthquake in 2009. And I am going to show you also another picture, because I think pictures help with earthquakes. This is the L'Aquila earthquake. It was a 6.3. It occurred in 2009, April. 300 were dead, 2.5 billion in damages, 20,000 buildings were destroyed in the hills of Italy. Um, it was a significant tragedy and one which was made more um, um, clear to the population, more devastating to the population because there was a lot of concern about this earthquake before it happened. You said before it happened, it's a story. In early 2009, prior to the earthquake itself, seismic activity increased in Italy. So there were what were called swarms. 
I told you before, sometimes small earthquakes happen and no big earthquake follows. This is not an uncommon phenomenon in, in earthquake seismicity. And swarms are actually not, even in Italy is one of those places where this occurs more than in, in many other places. So swarms are really not uncommon in, in Italy as a process in the earthquake system. However, they got these swarms last spring and it started to worry people. These might be potential foreshocks. They were felt very widely and the public became quite nervous. In addition, what didn't help this whole process was that there was a technician working at one of the local laboratories, one of the government laboratories, and he was measuring radon. And radon is one of those things that people think might in some places show up before, be released from the ground before an earthquake happens. Whether you, believe, whether you agree with that or not, it's made public news. It's, been, it's made the news and people know what it is. And so he issued forecasts under his own name. And they were false alarms, at least two of them. But again, people became even more nervous. And what happens with governments is they don't like it when people get nervous. And so the local government, the local um, civil protection organization, issued a, did a study and concluded and issued it on March a statement that said there's no reason to say that the sequence of events of low magnitude can be considered precursory to a strong event. There are those in the community who would tell you that, it, that a mathematical analysis of those swarms would have suggested there was a small but measurable increase in the likelihood of a large event. Again, if you looked at the statistics of Italy over time, it would be small. There are lots of swarms. But sometimes, every now and then, one of those swarms is followed by a large event. So that wasn't scientifically correct. What it was. Re what it was really aimed at was calming the community. And of course, government officials have a burden to do that as well. And this is a very, so they were put in a very difficult situation. Unfortunately, a year ago, seven scientists and other experts were indicted on manslaughter charges. That trial was started and was actually begun in September. There's still no resolution to that. But um, the judge directed the members of the national government's Great Risks Commission, which evaluates potential for national hazard, to go on trial, again, September of this year. He said that they gave inexact, incomplete, and contradictory information about whether those small tremors that occurred near L'Aquila in the six months before the earthquake might be an, a grounds for a warning. One of the problems here is, again, we, there's, there's a lot of uncertainty in what we know about what four shocks can do. And there was no, there was at that time for them no way to actually, they had no way to officially put a number on what that increased hazard might be. There's been a lot of studies since, a lot of commissions since that have talked about what should have been done. But the idea here is that if you quantifying the increased probability of an earthquake based on some kind of precursory phenomenon, seismic precursory phenomenon, and communicating it properly to the, to the public is the biggest challenge we have. That we need to figure out how to do that in a responsible way that on one hand doesn't, of course, panic people, and on the other hand allows them to actually think of the concrete, th know the concrete things that they could do to protect themselves and their communities. Many modern societies have some form of agency today with a statutory responsibility for earthquake assessment, including a mandate to use the best available science in estimating earthquake hazard. California and the US, for example, do. Italy now does as well. Today, that definition should include time-dependent seismicity-based earthquake forecasts, such as the one you saw earlier, um, although they generally do not. The Chinese, however, do use methods like this. And they have been for um, actually for a couple of years now assessing in, in an ongoing way their hazard based on seismicity methods like this. This is, the fact that they have not done this in the past doesn't mean it isn't going to happen. It is, it is the, it is, there is currently a project um, being initiated in California between the USGS and the Southern California Earthquake Center to, do, to evaluate how they would do operational earthquake forecasting, how they would issue warnings in the same way that you do for a hurricane, but again, in a slightly different fashion, how, what, how you would assess that probability, how you would then communicate that probability pro um, in a correct way to the public. So again, they would have measurable, quantifiable things that they could do to protect themselves. 
one of the questions here is how would one of the questions here is is not just how you would actually do that. There's a lot of work being done on, on the best way to do that. But the second question is how how would those operational forecasts be used by all parties? By all parties, I mean industry, insurance, emergency hazard providers, as well as the person with their house um, next to the San Andreas Fault or next to um, uh, the Western Cascadian um, seismic zone. So again, you could use both real-time seismicity data like this. You could also then use ground motion prediction equations like the ones Gail showed you earlier. And you could run them through, through real-time or near real-time analysis that would tell you what the increased hazard is and what the increased likelihood of ground shaking is in different places as a result of these increased probabilities of events. And we have a project that we're just kicking off. We're just getting the funding for um, at Western that would allow us to use um, high performance computing and, um, and special streaming software in, um, uh, developed by a, a proprietary company that would allow us to literally take real-time data from seismometers and from, from other um, uh, uh, data streams and use the ground motion equations such as, um, as Gail showed you earlier and actually produce those maps on, again, a real-time or near real-time um, um, basis. And that's one of the things that we think is actually quite um, uh, exciting about this. Those, those estimates could be provided to um, different groups. They could be tailored for particular uses, whether you're interested in business interruption or emergency hazard. You could, if, if you actually set up this streaming software, you could ask for your particular bit that you want. This is really an analytics approach to doing this. And we think that um, it's got um, a, a lot of potential uses in the not too distant future, as I said. Finally, I'd like to close with one last example of the kinds of things you can do if you have a collaboration like this, and that's earthquake early warning. So the idea here is that really the, the time, the velocity of an electromagnetic pulse of a radio signal of, of, of the internet, okay, for example, of information travel across a, some distance is faster than the actual seismic waves. So if you have a seismometer close enough to where the earthquake happened and you record and you figure and you record an initiation of an earthquake and you can compute what the likely magnitude of that is from the initial first wave motion there, you can then broadcast to other locations some potential user, like, an, again, a hospital or a bridge or a railroad, and I say railroad for a reason, a railroad, and get them to shut down services or be prepared for the upcoming ground shaking. And you're not going to gain much time here. I have to be perfectly honest with you. You're going to gain anywhere from 2 to 20 seconds, if you're lucky. But there are a number of programs around the world that have actually started test cases of how they would do this. And I show you this map here. And I actually show you this partly for John's benefit. This is from the E-Alarms um, website in California. California has a, a good deal of money um, in this program. And they have this map of places that are starting their earthquake early warning systems under development. And they also have active ones here you can see in blue, Japan, Taiwan, Romania, Turkey, and Mexico. You'll notice. Canada is not on here. But I like to tell the story that my first meeting with John Adams, who you saw earlier and Paul talked about, was when I visited him at the GSC in Ottawa when I first arrived in Canada. And he showed me what I think might have been one of the first earthquake early warning systems that was um, implemented. Um, it was a, it's a, a program um, to actually shut down railroads when a level of shaking um, at certain seismometers gets above a certain number. And I think John could um, tell you a lot more about how, what's happened to that in, in the interim since. That was almost 10 years ago. But, um, um, these things are actually practical if you implement them in the right way. And this is an example of the probability of occurrence in the next 30 years of certain levels of ground shaking. That's what these colors are, modified Mercalli. We can, you can think of a, that, that level 8 as being this orange color here. There's about a 40% probability that you'll have that. And this is the, these are the, time, um, the times you might have, the, the numbers of seconds, 0 seconds, 5 seconds, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, or 30 seconds that you might have in which to. These are all based on where those are located. You can do simulations of this, and this is in California. The kinds of time windows you might have in which to get that message out and prevent future hazard. Well, we've been looking at this possible at, at, at doing earthquake early warning, what it would take to do earthquake early warning really in Cascadia. and. Um, it turns out that it's a little tricky to assess that because we haven't had very many large events. 
recently in Western Canada. We haven't even had that many moderate-sized events. And you need to have that kind of data in order to figure out what the magnitude relationship is, how big these things are going to be. So what we've done instead is we've headed to Japan, where we now have all this new data, and um, some very nice large aftershocks and resulting seismic records associated with them. And again, this is work that, that we've been doing at Western between Gail and myself and some of her students and some of ours. And, um, and I would say that it's actually, this is a really interesting result because my student, Acha Shagi, has been working on earthquake early warning. And Gail's student, Hadi Gofrani, has, um, who was also the ICLR winner last year, of the, this past year of the um, uh, ICLR Student Award, um, They've been um, working together on the data sets, because he was also interested in this data for his ground motion prediction equations, which you saw. Well, it turns out that one of the data sets that exists there that doesn't exist in very many other places is borehole seismometers. So we have data from borehole seismometers, that's these, and we have two surface <laughs> networks, so surface seismometers and their networks. And it turns out that the relationships that are developed with surface seismometers can be noisy, and the, but historically that's the only ones we have because most of the data that's out there comes from ground space seismometers, seismometers on the surface of the Earth. Um, today, we now have these lovely borehole seismometers, and you can see that we have many fewer records, 316 versus the, the 1,100 and the 554 that we have from these two, but that if you look at the standard deviation on the estimates you get for those magnitudes, you reduce them by as much as 25% when you work with the borehole seismometers. This is a new relationship developed by my student and, and with help from Hadi, and again, by, um, all, by approximately a third if you're actually looking at PGV. So you do quite a bit better with many fewer stations if you can actually get input implement borehole seismometers for this purpose. And this is um, quite a, a new result. We're quite excited by it. And actually, what you can do is you can test how close you come. So you have a large, in the case of Japan, aftershock from the magnitude 9 event, in this case, a, a 6 and a half. And if you use borehole data, you can actually get to within um, this, this is the 6 and a half. This is um, the 6 and a half. And you can get, um, no, this is not right. My student sent me the wrong figure. This should be 6 and a half. And this is also six and a half, and this is six and a half. The line is what you're shooting for. She's misplotted this. But you can see that with the borehole data, you come much, much closer on each of these. And you also come closer with the borehole data here for this magnitude seven, with again, many fewer records as well. So you're actually doing, this particular network doesn't do anywhere near as well as either of these. These are about, um, uh, these are about comparable, comparable in estimating the upcoming magnitude of that event. However, you need fewer stations when you use the borehole data. And one of the advantages of that is you therefore need less time. So now you've gained more on your seconds when you want to have 20 seconds instead of 10 seconds or 10 seconds instead of 5 seconds to produce these early warnings. And so finally, um, it's the exponential inc increase in data over the last 30 years that has really allowed us to think about the possibility of now doing earthquake forecasting or time-dependent earthquake hazard in, in ways that we never could before. And of course, the larger goal here is to find specific ways to make that then useful to the community through, something, through collaborations such as we find here at the Strategic Network. Thank you.